So we have one more debate. Submassive PE should be thrombolyzed. Our two contestants, our two contenders, are number one, Anand Swaminathan from New York City, and number two, Ian Beardsdell from Southampton, UK. Both emergency physicians, they've had the most pre-game hype and pre-game uh, smackdown that we've seen on Twitter to date. It started weeks ago. Anand, I think, throwing some of the first punches. So let's give a big round of applause for Anand and Ian. Except I need a clicker. <laughs> All right, thanks, Risa. Hello. So I know all of you guys are on Twitter, except not right now, but I know you guys are all on Twitter, and you heard the back and forth between me and Ian. And you know, people have come up and asked me over the last couple of days, are you guys really that mean to each other? Do you really not like each other? And the truth is that we really don't like each other. And we are not going to raise the level of discourse today. So I'm just going to start off with the first punch. Ian, if you are not giving thrombolytics, to patients with submassive pulmonary embolism. You are an ignorant slut. All right. <laughs> I've already been told that I can't say big fucking clots. Now what do I have? All right, so time. Time is the specialty of the emergency physician. It is our niche as emergentologists. This is what we do. We look at the patient and decide how much time they have, how much time we have to make a decision on treatment. Now, when the patient is really sick, we have very little time, and actually, our decisions are easier. When the patient's not so sick, we have lots of time to think about it and discuss it. But somewhere in between, we have a problem. And remember that everything we're doing is simply buying the patient time. Pulmonary embolism is no exception. We give them heparin so they break down the clot on their own. Maybe we'll pull the clot out with an embolectomy or use a catheter-directed lytic approach. We have options, but all of it is simply to buy the patient time for their own recovery. So let's take a little case. We have a young, healthy person. Let's call him Ian. Ian is a young, healthy man. <laughs> and he decides to travel for a social media and critical care conference, gets on the flight, but he's had a hard week. So he drops an Ambien and a couple martinis and he passes out. When he gets off the flight, he notices a little pain in his calf, doesn't think much of it. But over the next couple days, he becomes more short of breath. And he really gets worried when he can't walk down the street without huffing and puffing. And he thinks, sure, maybe I'm just out of shape, but something's wrong. And he shows up in your emergency department. There's no debate over what he has. This is easy. Clearly, Ian has a pulmonary embolism. But where on that spectrum of PE does he lie? Does he have the subsegmental where maybe we don't need to do anything for him, give him an aspirin and a pat on the back? Well, probably not, because he's pretty symptomatic, so it's probably not a subsegmental PE. Does he have the big fucking clot where you're going to die? Probably not, because he's stable. He looks pretty good. So we're somewhere in that in-between area. A submassive PE, a term that I don't like very much, as you guys already know, but we'll use it today, because I don't want to confuse Ian up here. Submassive PEs are stable, maybe a little tachycardic, maybe slightly hypoxic. They may even have episodic hypotension, but overall, they're stable. So why would we even consider giving a drug like Altaplace, like TPA, to a patient with a submassive pulmonary embolism? It doesn't make any sense. Well, the reason is because 10% of these patients will become the massive pulmonary embolism. They will deteriorate, and 5 to 7% of them will die. 5 to 7% of patients with submassive pulmonary embolism will die. And that's why we think about this. But Ian's going to tell you that I can't save lives by lysing submassive pulmonary embolism. The data doesn't show that, and he's only slightly correct. We recently had a JAMA meta-analysis that shows that we do improve mortality in submassive pulmonary embolism, but it's more of a signal than a fact. It's not quite robust enough for us to say and claim a mortality benefit, and I'm not going to do that either. What we're really looking at is long-term outcomes. We know that we reduce the risk of a recurrent pulmonary embolism in patients who get lytics, but the big one is patient's exercise tolerance. It's relieving that RV strain and preventing them from developing pulmonary hypertension. Now, hypertension is not such a big deal, but pulmonary hypertension is, especially in young patients who are active, because they become short of breath. They can't exert themselves. Imagine yourself breathing through a straw. 
It's not so bad if you're sitting here. I know I give lots of people palpitations when they see me, but it's not that bad. But running down the street trying to breathe out of a straw is hard. And Ian is not going to like not being able to run down the street. He's not going to feel good about that. We know that we reduce patients' quality of life. We reduce their long-term abilities to be active when they develop pulmonary hypertension. So we have to try to prevent it. So what does the literature show? You know, we've got three recent studies. We've got Moppet, we've got Pitho, we've got Topcoat, and they should have given us an answer. But they didn't. They actually made things less clear because they used different patient populations, different drugs, different outcomes. But overall, there is a signal that we can reduce pulmonary hypertension in these patients. The long-term outcomes. This is the long game that we're playing here. We're probably not going to save the patient in front of us, but we can save them from being debilitated by pulmonary hypertension. Now, you can't talk about benefits of a drug without talking about the downsides. And Ian's going to tell you that if I give lytics to submassive pulmonary embolism, people are going to bleed out of their ears, their eyes, and definitely into their head. Major bleeding is going to be increased. Intracranial hemorrhage is going to be increased. But this is not true either. In the group under 65, there is no increase in major bleeding events. There is no increase in intracerebral hemorrhage. One of my residents asked me the other day, you're very pro-lytics for PE, but you're very anti-lytics in CVA. Why is that? Well, I'm also pro-lytics in heart attacks. In STEMIs, we know lytics help, and the bleed rate is low. This is a similar situation. The bleed rate in the under 65 group is not increased, so we have to be selective. Who's going to get lytics? The massive pulmonary embolism is going to get lytics every time. The subsegmental PE is never going to get lytics. And in between, we have to make a decision. For me, those patients who are young, who are healthy, who have pulmonary hypertension already, or they have RV strain on my echo at the bedside, I am going to strongly consider giving them lytics. And I'm going to do this with shared decision making. The way that I have this conversation with the patients that I've done it in, I have a drug. It's not going to save your life. But it is, I think, I think, it is going to allow you to have a better quality of life long term. That's how I have that conversation. And in the patients who are young, the bleed rate is not significantly increased. Now on the other side of that, the older patient who has COPD, they've already got pulmonary hypertension, as John Greenwood talked about earlier, or they're debilitated. I'm not even going to consider this drug because the harm far outweighs the benefit here. It's not like that young, healthy patient where the benefit outweighs the harm. In these patients, there's no reason for us to consider it. So my take-homes is that we have to be more nuanced. We can't think of subsegmental, submassive, and massive as the same disease. They're not the same disease. And we have to tailor our treatment based on where the patient lies within that spectrum of disease. Thank you guys very much. And Ian, bring it on. Oh, Okay, goodness. Which is the Ford? It's, uh, it's, uh, no, seriously, you which like is this. the Ford one? Still like the, Thank, oh, the Green Arrow. Okay. I'm so sorry. I had no idea there'd be so many people here. Um, gosh, um, I'm a bit confused because I thought a debate... I mean, I went to Oxford. I, well, I went to Oxford on a day trip, but I've seen how they do <laughs> debates there. And... Um, and I seriously thought that you did it a bit differently. Anyway, let's, um, I'm not sure this is going to work now, but let's just try Anyway, I stand here, right? Yeah? None of that wandering. No. Okay. <laughs> God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> so nervous, there's a chance I could swear, but I wouldn't do that in front of you. <laughs> okay. So should we thrombolize patients with submassive PE in the emergency department? I think it's important to start... <laughs> Sorry. I think it's important to start, if we can, just by revising a little bit about pulmonary embolism, because science yeah. is important. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. So what do you mean? Yeah. It's from Wikipedia. No. What? No. What? You can't do no. What? This is what they want. They want no. PowerPoint. Everyone wants PowerPoint. No. <laughs> you want me to do something different? Seeing as you asked. <laughs> okay, well, I suppose. <laughs> Ladies, don't be alarmed. It's a microphone. <laughs> so, 
So let's see if we could do something just a little bit different. The issue on the table. In patients with some massive pulmonary embolism, do we thrombolize with highly toxic agents or support with other therapies? Remember, this decision affects lives. I'm not here to tell you what to do, just to give you the evidence so that you can decide. When your patient's on death's door with massive PE, with over 50% obstruction of their pulmonary arteries and hemodynamic instability, we've got this one sussed, clot bust. But what about when the thrombus isn't that big, but at least one of the following exists? RV dilatation on echo or CT, ECG changes or elevated BMP, evidence of myocardial necrosis defined as we'd expect by that favorite of Rick body. That's right, my friends, no need for a phone-in. It's high sensitivity troponin. These submassive clots are more tricky, with doctors divided about their therapy, but don't worry, no need for you to guess. Very soon you'll know uh, the treatment's best. You must be out of your goddamn mind if you think treating a condition local to the lung should involve thinning all of the blood, reducing clotting, risking major bleeding, not least around the brain. All the evidence would tell us there's simply no mortality benefit. And even if there was, the contraindications mean very few patients would ever get it. But that in itself is not enough. You've come to smack seeking more information. We'll go into the evidence more deeply so you can treat submassive PE. There's plenty of papers and plenty of evidence. Surely the answer lies somewhere within them. But before we get on to that, let's just consider it historically. Every condition we've treated with lysis has either been superseded or disputed. Infarctions, both myocardial and cerebral, once thrombolized, it's now irrefutable. This treatment is practically medieval, yet here we are, still considering it suitable. Surely we must learn from our past and not use a treatment that should be outcast. I really do like the one they call Swami, but on this subject, I think he's balmy. Let's talk about facts, not opinion, then I'm sure you'll agree I'm winning. It is so nice, it is so nice to have evidence on my side. It is so nice, it is so nice to have evidence on my side. Let us start by looking at a paper published recently, a registry trial conducted retrospectively. 16,000 patients with objectively confirmed PE, they looked for an association between lysis and mortality. The results they found, well, the results, they won't surprise you. More patients died from this toxic therapy. But friends, this is just the beginning of this rather complicated story. Let's move on to consider a well-performed RCT. In 2002, several hundred were enrolled to...
Wow. Um, <laughs> see you guys in 2017. I just wanna, I wanna point out a couple things for the record. Ashley, you're dead to me. No <laughs> elephants, stuffed or otherwise, were harmed, okay? So those of you who are thinking like PETA, like, oh, Swami's an animal rapist? No, I'm not. Um, Ian brings up good points. My voice is better than his, you'll see later. Uh, Ian brings up great points. We don't. We don't have the best evidence. The evidence is really not on either side. I told you what he was going to say. It's, the patients get bleedy, but not if they're under 65. I think what we need to do... <laughs> I think what we need to do is look to the future of where we're moving. Where, what should be next? I think catheter-based lytics is hopeful, but we don't have evidence for that. Inhaled nitric oxide, it's hopeful, but we don't have evidence for that either. So what are you going to do at the bedside. You can sit and watch and give them heparin like you would to the subsegmental PE. That's fine, that's what you wanna do. Or we can decide that there are patients who are gonna benefit from this and we're gonna make the call at the bedside for that individual patient. And we have to individualize that care, we can't generalize it. So, oh, this is tough. You do have the evidence a bit on your side, but not as much as you would think. We're moving forward. We need to really think critically about that patient in front of us and determine whether we want them to be pulmonary cripples or we want them to be able to walk down the street to pick up their kids, to do the things that they want to do. Okay, that was an excellent debate. Before I call everybody up on stage, Michelle, what can you share with us about this Pro versus con, lysis and submassive Almost PE. Almost speechless on my behalf. <laughs> yeah. uh, I Agree. had the benefit of watching the polls as they moved during the, uh, the performance, I, I guess you would say, <laughs> and they were very telling, as you can imagine. Stay on. you got to stay, stay on. on. <laughs> Should we be thrombolizing? Stop, Stop it. <laughs> no one's Submissive BFCs, no BBCs. <laughs> We'll call them big bad clots. <laughs> Are we t bowing <laughs> And you'll be happy to know that Twitter has completely failed me, so we're going to go the old-fashioned way. Um, so we are going to do a no. show of hands. <laughs> firstly, I would, we're just going to go, firstly, who, who has won? Is it, raise your hands if you think Swami won the debate. Come on! <laughs> this, this got two more votes, doing this. <laughs> raise your, now, put them down, raise your hands if you think Ian won the debate. <laughs> <laughs> and we know he cheated, but it was fabulous. But, do you want to lace PEs? That wasn't the question. Oh, seriously. Oh. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> 